Let the church say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the church say hallelujah. Hallelujah. What a joy it is to be in his presence again. To bless the name of Jesus and to celebrate his goodness in our lives. Uh, this becomes the uh, anti-penultimate night for presentation. Uh, and we praise God for what we continue to do in our lives. Uh, today we had a very interesting day, my wife and I, as we visited with some folks, just to have conversation with them and to experience God's blessing in their lives. Uh, it reminds me that I'm still a pastor. Amen. Amen. It's, it's just beautiful to be the homes of people and to do what Jesus did. Uh, if you ever want to be encouraged and to be sharpened in your Christian experience, you get into some homes and talk about what God has done in your life. And you will see that the old stuff becomes new. When I hear the church say praise the, praise the Lord. It's like it gets new every time when you do this. And uh, it, gives you, it gives you encouragement. And I have noticed uh, in my ministry that I am stronger and more spiritual pastor when I do some visitation. And sometimes I visit some elderly lady. Can't even talk. Sickness in their bodies. But they are telling the pastor, I'm holding on to Jesus. And you know, they're struggling with just a little pain. And this person is struggling with pain all over. And the person is just smiling and giving God thanks. It makes you remember that somebody is worse than you are. But it's still good to praise the Lord. What do you say? Amen. So I greet you warmly tonight in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In the spirit of love, in the spirit of unity, and in the spirit of his soon coming. You know, it's nothing funny. You know, as I talk about pastoring, that's what I used to say every time I go to church. When I used to have eight churches, and then I had three, and then they, uh, four. Whenever I go up to greet the brethren, I greet in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, in the spirit of love, in the spirit of unity. And in the spirit of a soon coming. Because I wanted the people to be united. I want them to love God. And I wanted them to remember that Jesus was coming again. So I was saying it to them. Hoping that they would believe it soon. <laughs> so I want to greet you tonight. Uh, is there any visitor in the house tonight? Is there any visitor in the house tonight? Okay. Is there any visitor in the house tonight? Uh, you're coming for the very first time. Okay. Uh, okay. Let those who are coming from Huntington say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Those who are coming from Earl Street say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those who are coming from Tell Tell. <laughs> tell, tell Avenue say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. <laughs> those who are coming from Antioch say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That's where you're coming from. Union, those who are coming from Union, they'll say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Those who are coming from nowhere, say hallelujah. hallelujah. Those who are coming from everywhere, say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. This is the place where everybody is somebody, and Christ is Lord of all. Amen. We want to engage the word of God tonight again, but before we do that, I want you to touch your neighbor and say, neighbor. 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 You look like you could use some cash tonight. Let me see the hands of those of you who have a money problem. <laughs> now, 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 Antioch Church that has been built over there will not have a problem. I did not ask you if you had a no money problem. I asked you if you had a money problem. That means you have too much money. <laughs> So, where's the elder? And the church rock. So, you go to those people, they have the money, amen? <laughs> those of you who have a money problem, a no money problem, let me see your hand. <laughs> so, touch your neighbor as a neighbor. You look like you're going to use some cash tonight. But touch your neighbor as a neighbor. Our God is bigger than all our problems. Everybody say, I. I. Young people say, I. I. I'm taking a little more something, man. 
<laughs> need to give you some dumping and ackee and salty. <laughs> Run down! Come on, you don't know that. <laughs> Let's go, young people. Aye. Aye! After two, we have to do this. After two, yeah? After two, I want you to shout at me until this roof goes up. After two, one, two! Aye! Hey, hey, you didn't get it. Let's go again, let's go again, let's go again. I have to beat up my team, you know. Let's go, let's go. After two, when I say two, you should say I. All right? After two, one, two! I like it. Let's go again. You get to the energy. One, two! Aye! After two again, one, two! Aye! All the men say aye! Aye! All the women say aye! Aye! The church say aye! 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 I can! I can, do. I can do. I can do all things. I can do all things, I can do all things through Christ. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. Let the church say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the church say hallelujah. hallelujah. If you're on your way to heaven, stand to your feet tonight as we look into the word of God, the GPS, the roadmap to glory. In the book of Genesis chapter 6, Reading from verse 1 until we get to verse 8. This becomes the launching pad for our word tonight. Genesis, the sixth chapter. Reading from verse 1 until we get to verse 8. Let us pull apart the drapery and look at the pleat of chapter 6. The drapery of chapter 6 and the pleat of chapter of verse 1 to eight. If you're there, let me hear you say amen. amen. If you're not there, so hold on for me, preacher. I'm waiting for you. If you can't find it, go to the table of contents. And if you still can't find it, come to the altar for prayer. I suspect we are there together now. Let's go together in the word of God. So I'll go first and then you follow after in concert. And it says in the King James Version in chapter 6 of Genesis, in verse 1, it says, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, the daughters were born unto them. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with men, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. And God saw the wickedness of man that it was great in the earth. That every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Verse 7 the Bible says, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both men and Verse 8 and together. This is the word of the living God. Amen. Father, in this moment, stand up in this house as you have done on numerous occasions and lift your word above your name. We ask Heavenly Father that you will give your words direction and power simplicity and authority. We ask Heavenly Father you'll scatter principalities and powers and subdue the forces of darkness. I ask Heavenly Father that you will be with the message, the messenger, and those who hear the message. I ask Father that you have, as you have promised in your word that if you are lifted up, you will draw all men unto you. I pray that you will lift up yourself in this house tonight. And I pray, Divine Father, that you will feed us at your table. May we come to know you as Lord and Savior, transform lives, and reform characters in Jesus' name. Let God's people say praise the Lord. Let God's people say praise the Lord. 
You may be seated in his presence. On your way to your seat, with a touch your neighbor and help me announce the topic tonight. Grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace in the eyes of the Lord. Let's revise that. Touch your neighbor and say neighbor. Grace in the midst of the flood. I want for you to touch the first neighbor and say neighbor. It is dangerous to follow your own imagination. But touch your neighbor and say neighbor. Oh neighbor. Trust in the Lord. With all of your heart. Let's go again on the first one. Touch the first neighbor and say neighbor. It's dangerous to listen to your own heart. But touch the next neighbor with excitement as a neighbor. Oh neighbor. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, there is a, a tower built in Italy called the Pisa Tower. Yes. That tower is leaning out of perpendicular. The scientists travel every year to look at that tower. Mm. For that tower, which is approximately 810 years of age, every year it leans one twentieth of an inch out of perpendicular. It is believed that that tower will soon tower over, uh, tumble over. But some recent renovation uh, upon that tower caused it to still stand. But it is called a place, Pisca is the place of the tower. And when I did some research on that word, Elder, I discovered that it means shaky or sandy ground. You see, there is something a reason for the tower to be leaning over for the tower is built on sandy ground the tower is built on shaky foundation and if the foundation is shallow or shaky the building cannot stand am i talking to the church when i was building my small house in jamaica i, I watched very carefully because at that time i could manage my schedule some more and so i was there to watch the foundation being done and I watched carefully because I wanted to understand what the builders were doing. They explained the thing to me, but I wanted to know as well. Because I wanted to catch some of the trade. So if it comes time that I need to build something, at least I can dig a foundation. Come on and say amen for the future. I have ambition. Come on and say praise the Lord. Right. So, so I watched very carefully as they were digging the foundation. I noticed also that there was a part of the land that they began to dig. And, and as they began to dig the place, they met upon stone. And I asked the builder, why is it that you have dug around the stone and you have not dug out the stone? He said to me, Pastor, as he tapped me on the shoulder, he was an elder that I had now ordained some years ago when I was pastor in this district. He tapped me on the shoulder and said, Pastor, let me tell you what is happening. This spot where the stone is is the strongest part of your foundation because although we have gone deep into the ground into the ground into the uh, into the, into the dirt it is not as strong as the stone so what we are going to do pastor is that we're going to cast our, our concrete upon the stone and i can guarantee you pastor don't worry about how shallow this part looks for the stone is strong it is sturdy it is unmovable it is durable and i said to him i understand now and so when i look in matthew chapter 7 and the bible tells me that there are two types of builders one who built upon the rock and one who built upon the sand then the thing came back to my mind and i said hey i understand what i was digging foundation i know what it means to build on jesus the solid rock understanding that all other grounds are sinking sir and ladies and gentlemen in every generation in every house in every tribe, there are two types of builders. There is the one who built on the rock, Jesus Christ. And all they want to know is about Christ and him crucified. But there are others who want to build on popularity, on fame, on their own desires. But I've stopped by here on the way to Andrews University to let you know that if you want a life that is lasting, you've got to build on Jesus, the solid rock. You've got to build on something that is not fleeting or shiftable, but something that stands forever. Amen. Yes. I want to take your minds back to the pages of our scripture reading. We find, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, that the second time that God said to have come down to talk with any man, after he talked with, the third time, after he talked with Adam and Eve, and then talked with
the king. Notice with me carefully, ladies and gentlemen, that in the Garden of Eden, we saw two different nations. We saw two different sides. But there was God who said that don't touch this thing. And Satan says, I'm going to improve upon God's plan. And I'm asking you to touch it. But God, God is hiding something from you. And after a while, there was this guy called Cain. He was birthed after Abel. And while he came out of his mother's womb, he came out as a seed of the devil. He came out with the intent of the devil. Can I just talk to you for a moment? I want you to know that in every church, there are some seeds that are planted by the devil. Can I talk to you just for a moment? But when Jesus had 12 disciples, one was a devil. And if you have two people baptized, one is a devil. Am I talking to the church? That come like strange gospel to you, but it is the truth. For even in the church, Satan plants his seed. Come on, come on and talk to me. Come on, let it be known. Mm. For under the nose of God, there came Lucifer, the devil. And in the very church of God, where Jesus was a pastor, there was Judas. What I'm suggesting to you, make sure that your life is built on the correct thing. Make sure that you are broken in the hands of God. Make sure that you are melted by His grace. Make sure you are molded by Him for any other thing that molds you. Jesus said these words to His disciples. What will it profit a man to gain the entire world and lose his own soul? There are people who are building on the sifting sand of life. And ladies and gentlemen, when Jesus comes, they will not stand. Amen. You see, many persons like to hear about the prosperity gospel. That tells us that Jesus is always chasing after us. But there's going to come a time when he stops chasing. Come on, come on and talk to me, somebody. Come on and talk to me, somebody. These are serious days. And so I want to I want to carry you through how this thing develops. For we are told that God said to Cain and Abel, I want for you to take a sacrifice and offer it before me. And so Cain decided that he was going to take what he wanted to take to God. For he was not making any sacrifice. But Abel on the other hand says, whatever God says, that's what I'm going to do. If God says it, that settles it for me. I have no other opinion. I have no other creed. I'm trusting in Jesus Christ. But Cain on the other hand says, I'm leaning to my own understanding. I'm doing my own way. And the Bible makes it clear that from that moment, there were two distinct nations. Two distinct. We get to chapter to chapter six. That's where it becomes more pronounced. For now, if you look in chapter five, you will notice that it talks about the descendant of Cain. And everywhere in that chapter, you will see nothing about God. God is not mentioned. It's just about Cain and how Cain was possessing and how Cain was conquering. But the Bible wants you to know that in Cain's mind, God did not exist. But if you look after Seth came into play, who replaced Abel in chapter 6, the Bible lets us know that everything about uh, Seth was about God. And God did this, and God was doing this, and God was speaking to Seth, and God was walking with Seth, and God was this. And then he talks about Enoch coming, and all of these guys. It was all about God in the life of Seth. But in the life of Cain, there was no God mentioned. Why was this so? For chapter 6 will give the example of it. For chapter 6 tells us now that the sons of God and the daughters of men started to have a controversy. You see, the sons of God represents the Setites. Those who came from the lineage of Seth. But the daughters of God, the, the, the daughters of men represented those who came from Cain descendants. Mm. Because now, notice very carefully in your text, and in the text before, in chapter 5, you will notice, beloved brothers and sisters, that in chapter 4 and chapter 5, you will notice that nothing was mentioned about God in Cain. But why was that so? For here's what the Bible says now in chapter 6. The Bible says, and now men begin to multiply. 
Now, why is this significant? Because in Genesis chapter 1, in Genesis chapter 2, the Bible says, and man was made in the image of God. And in chapter 6, the Bible lets us know that it was no man making man in his own image, after his own imagination, after his own thought, his own opinion became his own God. And so we see a situation birth in this text that gives rise to this flood. So, so God was not just angry, but there was a replacement of God in the mind of the people around. Hmm. So God had a problem. For watch this very carefully. Then God says, in the midst of that, Noah finds grace in the eyes of God. So Noah now is from the tribe of Seth. And although in a perverse generation that had nothing to do with God, that had no imagination of God, there was one man who was standing up for righteousness. Can I talk to you just for a moment? When the generations and in our generation and every generation, when pollution of sin is running wild, God always has a remnant. God has a set of people who are set aside to lift high the banner of Prince Emmanuel. A set of people who will not be bought no soul. A set of people who will love God above popularity. God has a set. Here is what God wanted to say. Now, now, here is the two type of religion. The Bible lets us know that one was made in the image of man and one was made in the image of God. Seth and his descendants still maintain connection with God. But Cain and his descendants, they maintain connection with themselves. They said to themselves, I'm going to build. And notice how something did begin to change. Remember now, in the Garden of Eden, God says, I'm going to give Adam one wife. Can I talk to you? If you go back to Matthew chapter 24 from verse 29 downward, Jesus made this statement and as it were in the days of Noah, so shall it be when it comes to the end of time when the Son of Man shall come. And why did Jesus say this? Here is the solution of the matter. Jesus was saying this because in the beginning he gave man one wife. And it's not just about woman and wife, it's just about the intent of the heart. It's just that it manifests itself in relationship. I you so far? So the relationship is not to be seen as the ultimate, but just a symptom of the result of the heart. Hmm. And so watch this now. God says, I gave Adam and Eve one, I gave Adam one woman. Cain was the first man who took more than one wife. And whereas in the Garden of Eden, Adam placed value on his wife and called his wife Eve because she is going to be the mother of the nation. Nowhere in scripture is the name of Cain's wife mentioned, but she's only called woman. You didn't get it to miss it. For in the mind of Cain, those who are disconnected from God, sex and women are just targets. They are just symbols. They are just objects. But in the mind of the person who loves God, he values every creature of God as equal in the sight of God. So when God says they were married and given into marriage, it means that they have reduced human beings to just objects. You didn't get to miss it. And ladies and gentlemen, we have come to an age in which sex is promoted everywhere. Sex is shown like the a matter of fact, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to sell a product, you attach a woman to it. Yes, yes. you're not listening to me. Yes. Yes. A man selling a car. Mm. And you see a woman with panty and bra. Yes. What does a car have to do with panty and bra? Come on and talk to the church. Because the Bible and Satan knows that the very imagination of our heart is to satisfy the lust of the eye, the pride of life, and the lust of the flesh. And this is linked to our insatiable appetite for the pleasures of this world. And that is why we are reaping the whirlwind of sexual transmitted diseases. We are reaping the whirlwind of unwanted pregnancy. 
by reaping the world in of broken marriages and people just getting married and divorcing for nothing. A man doesn't like his wife anymore because she gives birth. He says, I want a fresher flesh. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? You don't know it's a joke. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Not, not only that, but when God says that as it were in it, Jesus says in it, as it were in the days of Noah, it also means that there is a sin called lasciviousness. Let me break it down for you. Lascivious means that it's old men who have an insatiable appetite for young girls. That's lasciviousness. So the man doesn't want the man doesn't want to come to the fact that he's an old man. Everywhere on him is changing. Everything is changing about him and decreasing Ella. But he wants to hold on to his own pride and ego and he feels a younger woman will help him to reach this. The Bible says that they were marrying and giving it to them. Not only that, but I discovered something else in the text. The Bible lets me know, and I read in the original language, that not only were they doing that, but the very imagination was to think how to replace God. So that when no one was preaching, they, there were persons trying to find scientific reasons to debunk Noah's message. And how did the Bible describe Noah? The Bible says Noah was perfect. It means that Noah was complete in his obedience to God despite the corruption around him. And then the Bible says he was simple, naive. That means he was unconcerned, unmixed up, and don't even know what was happening around him because he was not interested to know what was happening in the world. His mind was set on Jesus Christ. That, now notice this. Here's what God says. God says, the wickedness of man is so corrupt that I'm going down. This is, a set, this is the third time that Jesus is coming down. He came down in the cool of the day to reach out to Adam and Eve. He came down when, when, when Cain killed his brother and says the blood of your brother is crying out in the earth to me. And now Jesus comes down again. He says man's heart is so evil and evil can't. As a matter of fact, the Bible in the Hebrew says that not only was his heart evil in his manifestation, but in the core, in his bone, it was evil and evil continually being produced and more evil in its intensity and its wideness was being produced in him. Let me break it down for you. It means that if he did this much evil, the evil that is built in him is wider and more severe. And when God saw that, God says, I must go down. Why did God come down? God came down to investigate. Not that he did not know, but to show man that he knows and he's trying to help them. Anytime God comes down in scripture, it is to save man from himself. For if man is not saved from himself, man will wipe out himself, destroy himself, and destroy everything that he touches. And God has to save him from himself. But then the Bible goes further. The Bible says that it grieved God. So I want you to know how could God be grieved? Because God knew that Adam would have stepped aside and Cain would have multiplied the effect. And now these guys down here would have done worse. So how God grieved. The Bible lets me know that God was in labor pain. In Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 is the same word that is used. It means labor pain that comes not only from bearing child or children, but also from a severe mental stress and pressure. It symbolized what Jesus would endure in the garden of Gethsemane when the weight of sin rests upon his shoulder. From beginning, God was carrying the weight of the sins of the world upon his shoulder. From beginning, God was suffering because of what we have done. 
in the Bible says God was sorry. But something blew me away. Because I looked at the word sorry. And the King James didn't translate it well. <laughs> the word sorry is nekam in Hebrew. It means love and grace. In other words, God had pity and love for them so much that God's love reached out to them and God came down to Noah and said, Noah, my heart is paining me. I love them. I want to do something to save them. Build me an ark. The theme of this text is not about the destruction, but the love of God to save man from himself. He says, I'm going to build you something to take you out of the mess that you are in. I'm going to send you a, a ship to drive you away from the destruction. When I wipe out this place and make a new earth, I want you to be there. And God be the ark. That was big to see the whole world at that. And here's this now. In Peter, the Bible says that from the building of the ark, God's patience endured. Yes, and can I tell you what scientists and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, archaeologists suggest? That the ark itself took 75 years to build. So when Peter says that from the building of the ark, the mercy or the grace or the patience of God endure, it means for 70 years when Noah struck on a hammer and, and put a nail, that that sound was evidence, salvation has come. Turn from the evil ways, ladies and gentlemen. And in these last days, God is sending a message in Revelation chapter 14, verse 16. He says, another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth, to every nation, to every kindred, to every tongue and people. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. But I want to tell you something else. When God came down and he says, I'm going to judge man, here's what the Bible says. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. The judgment of God was in favor of Noah. They didn't get it. So the judgment had nothing to do with the destruction of man, but for the destruction of sin. It was never God's intent to destroy man. Because I just told you that the word sorrow means grace and love. It means that his love was so much toward us that he wanted to protect us from ourselves. And the Bible tells us that he came down to rescue us. He came down to clean us up. He came down to take us out of sin and to plant us on heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The Bible says that he's able to save from the guttermost to the utmost those who come to him in Christ Jesus. Is that willing that any should perish? But also come to repentance. Hmm. In the midst of that, God said to Noah, in your text it says, God says, because man is so evil, their years shall be 120. This is not describing how long they will live, but how long their probation will last. God says, I love them so much. That although in my head justice is eminent, yes. I am going to delay myself because of now. Can I talk to you just one moment? Yes. God is so merciful that God always set a man in whom he can find delight so that he may save the rest of us. So when God found Noah, Noah was there to appease the justice of God by saying, there is one righteous, there is one who loves you, there is one who wants to be saved. And God says, if there is one, I'm willing to wait on the other children for 120 years. Can I bring you some news? God has been waiting in this generation for 2,000 years 
and he has sent a message to this house to let you know that today is a day of salvation. If you hear his voice, hold not your heart. Yes. Hmm. God says, no. <laughs> I love it. I wish I could tell you. Oh boy, it was Now, before the judgment came, Noah acted as a prophet to whom God reveals his secret. And the secret was this. He was saying, Noah, tell them for me. Because it was from creation I was trying to tell them. But in case I, they are not listening to me, maybe they will listen to you. So tell them for me. And not only that, but when God says to Noah, tell them for me, God was also setting things in place so that man could escape from himself. But here's what Ellen White says, and I picked it up in, in, the, Bible, in the scripture as well. The Bible tells us that when men heard Noah, they mocked Noah and find every fault in Noah's gospel. In fact, the Ellen White tells us that the people were became, becoming concerned that this guy Noah might have been right. But here's what the philosophers say. Here's what the scientists say. Here's what the, 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 the meteorologists say. They say we have never seen water before coming down from nowhere. So let us not be deceived by now. He is just a fanatic. He doesn't understand. He's not sophisticated. Look at him. He's a simpleton. <laughs> and guess what? The Bible says yes. Now is a simpleton. Because I have arranged that the simple things of this world will confound the wise. Because men have become wise in your own imagination and your own thoughts and not remembering that the beginning, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of your wisdom. Yeah. So God says, Noah, set up the ark for me. And Noah says, yes, I'll do it. But Noah had a problem. For Noah had never seen rain himself. <laughs> and to build an ark where there was no sea nearby for the river that was running by presumably the great river Euphrates was not big enough to contain that thing now I've never seen any because God in creation says let the waters above the firmament stay up there and the waters within the earth stay down there so God in creation set the thing in place and know the man who now study God's creation said that God cannot go against his own law. He's a slave to his own creation. They have now reduced God, taken God out of his creation and abandoned God and says they can manage creation. Can I just stop by here to let you know that men are playing around with God's creation. That earthquake in diverse places is not natural anymore, but are engineered by men. The Bible says when you see these things begin to happen, they, it is the beginning of sorrow. The same word sorrow comes back again. The Bible says that the earth is groaning in sorrow as a woman travailing in birth, ready to give birth. Can I talk to you, somebody? This thing means that what I'm not from, I, I, I swear experiences. When my wife is pregnant with our twin, I will be in the hospital where I do that. <laughs> and I will know what it means. Not know, but I will see what it means to have labor pain. But for now, let me tell you what others have told me. <laughs> no, <where is it? laughs> now watch this. Now, now, I discovered that when a lady is pregnant, Brother Mark, Sister Mark, when you were pregnant. <laughs> Sister Major, when you were pregnant. I understand that when a lady is pregnant, when it gets closer to the time, the pains get more intense and more frequent. Did I get it right? Yes, yes. See, like I'm reading some good books. <laughs> and, 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 and as it gets more intense and more frequent, it means that birth is just in sight. The Bible says that the whole creation crowns and the earth is travailing in pain. And what are the birth pains? Earthquake in diverse places. What are the birth pains? Wars and rumors of war. What are the birth pains? They are marrying and giving into marriage and have no thought of God. But man is running after money. 
Man is running after popularity. Man is chasing after music and fun and fun more. But the Bible says, when you see these things begin to happen, look up for redemption joy now. Look up for Jesus is on his way. It won't be long from now when the eastern skies will be thrown asunder and Jesus will come. We are living in the last days. When I walk on the streets, and I listen to even people who are in the church, I wonder if we realize that the last days are upon us. And can I tell you a sad news? The Bible says in our day, the young people helped him to build the ark. You have a nice smile. Don't go to hell with it. <laughs> the Bible says that the women help to the women help to carry the lumber. The men with their strength help to take the lumber. They help never to nail it together, but they never saw the importance of going in. And can I tell you how people do that in these days? They send their offering and their tithe. And says, you're having a church building, brother. Put this in there so God can bless me. Can I talk to you, somebody? If God were poor, you would not have asked for anything. For God owns the cattle upon a thousand hills. And if the very money that you have, including you, is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So if God wanted anything, he would not ask you. What God wants is your heart. He doesn't want your money. He doesn't want your Fame, he wants your heart. God says, I have given my all for you. Would you give me your all? Many will be in church building it up, preaching powerful sermons. Yet you can preach it. Check some men. They sleep with Satan at night. No, I better put it in English. They sleep with Satan in the night. <laughs> and in the day they are powering with Jesus, presumably. You know when Jesus comes, what he's going to say? <laughs> Jesus will look and say, Who are you? He says, Jesus, you don't remember me? I was at Antioch, you know. All the offerings, I took it up. A matter of fact, I got all the quiz right. <laughs> and I got $150. I was listening to the pastor, man. He's dramatic, you see. And Jesus says, I can't recall. I don't know you. Your face looks strange. And then he says, depart. I'm going to show you something else in the text. When the Bible says, God, the Bible says that God says, I will destroy man whom I've created. Here's what the Bible says in the Hebrew. He says he's going to erase their names from the book of life. Because man has become one with his sin. You didn't get that, you missed that. God did not want to destroy man. But man loved his sin so much that God was trying to separate man from the sin so that he could destroy sin. But God, man says, I'm not letting go of my sin. So when God was trying to kill sin, man was with the sin, so man got destroyed. God says, before the flood came, Jesus says, Noah, I'm going to build a covenant with you. That means God had a plan to fix man before he destroyed man. Come on, preacher. Here's what God says. God says, since creation has been reversed. Now watch this now. I'm finishing now. now. Finish now, now. Notice what happens in the text. When God started to create, before God started to create in terms of calling things into existence, there was water on the face of the earth. In the flood, water came back from up and beneath and made it tohu and bohu. That means formless and void. Are you with me? Yes, sir. Now, in, 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 in 
creation in Genesis chapter 1, verse chapter 2, verse 1, the Bible says that the Spirit of God hovered over the water. But watch this now in chapter 6. God says, I am making over creation. It's gone back to nothing. Man has become nothing. In fact, in the Bible, it says, God says, man and beast. It means in God's mind that man is dust again, just like the beast. And there's no difference between man and beast. And if I were to put that to your mind, little care, I want to let you know that in Isaiah chapter 1, God says, man is just like the beast. For man, for the beast, no his master and man don't know me so it has been reversed to the extent that animals know that they should go in the ark but man don't know when I was watching a tsunami 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 when that thing is coming in you see the animals and sister the big animals. They start to walk towards safety. Higher ground. You hear the animals singing. What man should be singing? Lord, lift me up and I shall stand. Thy faith on earth and stable land. But watch man. I'm saying, hear your man now. Turn on the thread. And let me, I like the thrill that I feel with the, with the alcohol in my hand. And the party is nice, and the vibes is right, and they're just marching down to destruction while the animal say, Lift me up, Lord. Lift me up, Lord. And man says, Down, 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 down. Go to the party, down. That's crazy. <laughs> The animal knew the direction where God's voice was. Yes, sir. But man did not know his master's voice. And here's what the Bible says. God says, my spirit can't plead for man's repentance anymore. I'm going to withdraw him. You know what this is called in New Testament? The unpardonable sin. For you have grieved the spirit so much by saying no to him so many times that God cannot find himself in you anymore. And all he can look at is the image of the devil and yourself. And God says, I don't know man. I can't find the image of that place in him. the dying moment of this sermon God does not want to take his spirit from you when David came down and realized that his sin was so severe that God was that he was threatening to take God's spirit from him he says have mercy upon me O God according to your tender mercies according to your loving kindness blot out my transgression and take not your Holy Spirit from me but give me a new heart tonight God wants to give somebody a new heart God wants to give you a new spirit God wants to give you a new destiny new heart new imagination yes. Yes. the Savior is waiting to enter your heart pastor would you sing that one for me Sorry to point upon you. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. And I have a serious appeal to me tonight. I want every person in this place who is not baptized to come to the altar. If you're not baptized, come to the altar. Everyone. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. As they begin to sing, I'm going to ask you to stand. And every person in this place who is not baptized will love Jesus come to the altar. And I have one instruction to give you when you come. Just like Noah, God says come to the ark. I'm saying come to the altar. And now he's waiting again. Come, 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 come. Come young people. You're not my best come. You're not my best come. Come. My sister at the back, come. I know that you don't like to come. Jesus speaks to me, ask you to come. Yes. 
still with me. You're still with me. I'm proud of you. Still with me. Come. Wherever you are in this thing, come. In this church, come. Come. God bless you. Stay with me. I'll just give them some cards for me, please. We're going to give them a simple instruction tonight. Where are you? Where are you in this church? Where are you? Don't you hear his voice knocking at your heart's door? Come put me the cards. Come put me the cards. I'm going to give you an instruction tonight. Come put me the cards. 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 With a level of consciousness and seriousness, give them the card. Follow the first instruction, which is to write your name and your number there on the address. That's the first instruction. instruction I'll give them. If there are others here you need to come. Don't indicate anything there. Just write your name. Hear me carefully. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. I had a brother. His name is Cleavy, was Cleavy. A guy and I, he was older than I was, he was a teenager when I was about eight. And so we were baptized at the same time. And one afternoon we were going to church. I was young and naive at the time, praise God. And while we were heading back to church for AY, in those days in Jamaica, young ladies used to wear a little thing right here. They call it a certain rider. <laughs> and he said to me, the others of them, my two other brothers said to me, go on to church, Peter, my pet name. They stopped. The last day they came to church. After a while, I started to preach when I was eight. And I understood what it meant to know that my brothers were not coming to church. So after I became a teenager, and after that, I started to beg him to come back. Every time I would see him, because I wasn't living where he was living at the time, I beg him to come back. He said to me, the last thing he said to me one day, he says, Peter, I have bought my pants already. I have bought my shirt. I have bought my shoes. That was, that was a, Wednesday was telling me that. He said, I'm coming to church on Saturday. The fatal Friday morning came. In a little community in Mitchellsville, I have never seen a man killed before. It's the first time I've seen it. Never heard of it. A man in the community took a two-edged knife and plunged it in my brother's heart. And when that was not sufficient, he wrenched the knife. We were far from hospital and far out of vehicle because it was done to me. He was up there. The bill a stretcher with both uh, uh, bamboo. But by the time he got halfway the journey, he died Friday before Sabbath. He thought for all these years, I have time. I have time. I'm young. I have time. I have not lived my life yet. But little did he know that the devil was delaying him for his own destruction. And when the guys in the ark realized that Noah was serious, it was when the door was shut and the thunderheads begin to form 
And every white sense that the places begin to shake and all their idols that they had built and their houses begin to crumble, that's when they realized that Noah was serious. They banged on the heart's door and said, Noah open, but God had shut it. I don't tell you this to scare you. Or if you told me that you were coming because you were scared, I wouldn't baptize you anyhow. But God wants nobody to be afraid of him. He wants you to love him. But I want you to know that delay is danger. Here's the last part of my appeal. You have four responses on your card. You have four responses on your card. You have four responses on your card. The first one says, I want to be saved when Jesus comes. The second one says, I want Bible study. The third one says, I want to... I want to accept Jesus as my personal savior. The last one says I want to be baptized. I don't call people just for prayer, for that is insufficient. I call people to make a, a decision for Christ. The decision that you make today, young people, and my dear beloved sister, will determine your eternal destiny. When the guys at the ark thought they were making a simple decision by marking Noah, it was their eternal destiny that was decided and they didn't know until it was too late. God is calling you to make a decision for him. And here's the formula. He that believes and is baptized, the very same shall be saved. That's what I'm asking you for. That's what God is asking you for. Indicate as God bids you. Do not leave your cards blank. People leave their cards blank saying, God, I want nothing from you. And I'm going to pray with you this morning. The church is in prayer. The eyes are closed. You're praying for these four souls at the altar. In this moment, their destinies are being decided. And yours as well. But not because you are baptized means that you are saved if you don't believe and trust God. So use this moment, congregation, as a moment to recommit your own life before God. Let's pray. Father, in this moment, I place my hand upon your children's head. And I claim their minds for your name's honor and glory. I claim the decisions that you are making to be the right one that will bring honor to your name and will also save your own souls. Oh, blessed Jesus, you died on the cross so that each of us may have life and have it more abundantly. And you asked me to answer the question, if heaven is so beautiful, what in hell would they want? When hell offers fire and destruction, and there's pleasure forevermore to your right hand in heaven. Help them to choose life. Help them to choose Christ. Help them to choose, Heavenly Father, glory in your presence. And reject the pleasures of sin which is just for a season. Oh God, I pray for these young people at the altar, these three young women at the altar, God. Satan wants to take them when they are young to mess them up, but you want to take them when they are young, Father, to shape them and to make something beautiful out of their lives. Help them to know, Heavenly Father, that the best friend to have is Jesus, and that there's peace and happiness and prosperity and joy forevermore with you. But only the pleasures of sin, only, Heavenly Father, will lead to destruction. I pray for my dear sister who loves you so much. For God, she's standing right here as a woman of wisdom. A woman who loves you and wants to please you. Give her the overcoming power tonight. And may she walk in a full and free salvation. We pray for the congregation too, Lord. Cover us under your blood. Keep us in your will. That we will not stand in your way. Help us, Heavenly Father, to straighten up and fly right and live right. We claim your blessings now forevermore as we go home. Now, Father, go before us to lead us. Stay behind us to protect us. Beneath us to support us, above us to shelter us. Inside of us to fill us up and give us power to do your will. 
May you put love in our hearts. Love for husbands, love for wives, love for children, love for parents. Love in this community. Love in the church of the living God. Finally and most importantly, may you give us love for God. In the name of the Father, in the name of His Son, in the name of the blessed Holy Spirit, let God's obedient and saved people say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let God's transformed people say hallelujah. hallelujah. Lift your hands and say thank you Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Lift your hands and worship the Lord. Praise the Lord. He's worthy to be praised. Walk from this place as though you have been delivered. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Amen. God bless you. Amen. God bless you. It was a joy having you tonight. God bless you.